and we're running just slightly early but if john is around maybe we can have a quick chat before the um talk starts i think um john's joining us Ah, right, here we here we go g'day john hey mark how's it going good thanks we were having a chat uh off uh we were having a chat the other night at the speakers dinner that's right um, yeah virtual speakers dinner it's interesting because one of the comments that's come up in our stage chat that's following following up from something belgi was talking about is a um chris miller was saying wouldn't it be amazing if there was a package manager for apis so you could just apt get or api get the sdk for your platform for example and that sort of thing in service discovery tools your talk is going to be a little bit around those sorts of topics isn't it it is, and it's actually ironic that we, uh, during our stand up this morning, we actually covered that. So we're actually shipping a client SDK for our API, and we're making an RPM of it. So, um, yeah, but I totally tuned in when when that question came up. So yeah, well, I'm trying yeah, to yeah. this conversation. I mean, it's I mean, it's definitely where we're going to need to go because we've got um, you know APIs. If we've got microservices and APIs um, at this level of um, comp composability. Within a, within a business, within an enterprise, but then also the open APIs as well, discover, to discover them just by looking at catalogs is going to get too hard. It already is. Yeah, and the vendors don't have a good solution for it either. You know, it, it's it's kind of a very much a hodgepodge right now. Like a lot of the API portals, they have a certain niche, but you know, to your point, you need the ability to just pull these things down on demand and just quickly take advantage of them and not jump through a lot of hoops with the, you know, website and registration and everything else. Yeah. One thing we were talking about the other night was um, how a city government that I've um, been in touch with, they've actually, when a contractor wants to build an API for the city government, they come to them and they show them their reference architecture. And then the city government has machine learning in place that will run through their suggested architecture and out of it identify what APIs that they currently have might be useful for building this new solution, you know? And you've got, you were saying, we're thinking about that, but we're thinking about it in a different way. Yeah, I think we flip it around in the sense that we're looking at ways to use machine learning to federate um, a central, and I hesitate to say like, like, like a very, extreme reference architecture, but reference architecture and best practices and federate those geographically or across organizational boundaries. Right, because okay. the, yeah, uh, there's a struggle there with, with maintaining quality and everything else um, across a large organization. Okay, wonderful. I'll um, jump off and let you get into your talk. Looking sure. forward to hearing it. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. This is I'm the CTO of Evercurrent, and today I'm going to talk about uh, an approach for automating API governance called Reference Architecture as a Service. Uh, so, just quickly to give you an overview of who Hypercurrent is, so we're a API and distributed ledger focused software development company uh, that delivers solutions, uh, products, and solutions uh, around APIs, microservices, distributed ledgers, uh, EIP, and uh, service meshes. So just to give you some personal context, uh, prior to joining Hypercurrent two years ago, I worked at MuleSoft for about seven years as a full-time employee and then you know, consulted around APIs and, and at the time service-oriented architecture uh, prior to that. But in, in those experiences and particularly within large organizations that were, uh, were, were working on things like APIs and microservices, the common theme I saw is that we, we generally saw API um, API innovation and adoption either from uh, pockets of innovation within a line of business or pockets of innovation within central IT. Uh, and, and usually across these these different innovation groups, the, the use cases were almost always internal, right? So, you know, generally it was a bunch of, uh, or maybe a small group of, of forward-leaning developers who were familiar with emerging niche open source technology and frameworks and, and want to take advantage of those for some sort of internal use case 
right? So maybe it didn't necessarily have a bunch of business buy-in, but had sort of the technical and political aptitude to get something uh, launched quickly, like from a POC standpoint to meet an internal goal. Uh, and, and usually these groups, um, because they were, were working independently, they were, were generally taking advantage of agile operational techniques and platforms. Uh, so specifically because they weren't kind of hampered by, um, by, by a, a top-down, you know, central IT group because they, they were kind of innovating in a pocket. They were able to do things more quickly than maybe the other mainstream uh, development projects that an organization might have proceeded. So, for instance, they might have been using technologies like Docker or Kubernetes or taking advantage of Node.js or, or some other technologies, which may not have been the mainstream of the organization's development. Uh, but, but generally, in my experience, these, you know, these, these projects were mostly successful and they generally fueled uh, interest in API and microservice development across an organization. Now, as this as this interest grew, you uh, you know you quickly had a scenario where API adoption grows as well, right? So you tend to see either these things happen independently or sort of coordinated, where these independent groups of the organization keep popping up, popping up over and over again. And then, if you're not careful from a central IT perspective, uh, it, it quickly becomes difficult because these teams begin diverging, and then subsequent ins inconsistency is introduced. And then, you know, some of the questions that I would get is, is you know, while we were talking to different groups, with even, even within the same line of business or across lines of businesses, you know, there'd be questions about, like, which contract language should I use for my API? Like, so, for instance, should I use Swagger or should we use RAML? Uh, then, you know, you have some groups that were using non-HTTP-based protocols, right? So you have some groups that maybe wanted to use um, Thrift or use gRPC. Uh, then security, right? This was all over the board. Uh, some groups who were just getting things, you know, deployed quickly. Uh, they may have APIs secured with just basic auth and no transport layer security, whereas other, you know, other pieces of the organization may have strict requirements around, you know, TLS and, and uh, payload encryption. Another big one was best practices, right? So, um, you know, some groups would just, you know, fly by the seat of their pants and would, uh, you know, just basically build something that met the business demands, deploy it, and really not follow any sort of enterprise-wide best practice. Uh, other groups who are more maybe uh, minded of the organization may go to a central IT group and ask which best practices should I follow? Like what are my API design guidelines? Uh, what are my API implementation choices? Which framework should I use? Uh, which best practices should I follow? Uh, you know, which, you know, which project management techniques should I use, right? All, all these things, you know, if they're not sort of, if there's no kind of guidance around them, they can be all over the board. You know, and then another big one I would get is event-driven APIs, right? So similar to the non-HTTP-based protocol APIs, th there'd be groups that may maybe want to leverage asynchronous messaging, right? So if I want to use something that's non-synchronous, like what are my options for asynchronous API transports? Is there an existing messaging broker I should use? Is it okay if I roll my own messaging infrastructure? Should I use Kafka, right? All, all these different questions. And if they're not answered quickly or there isn't guidance, then, um, you know, then these teams are going to diverge and you quickly have uh, sort of a mess from a, a top-down perspective. Now, ironically, to address this, the typical central IT approaches don't really work. One of the major benefits of APIs, microservices, and service meshes is that they enable, um, you know, just right architecture. So essentially, it, it lets it lets groups in the organization innovate very quickly, the same way a startup might. Uh, so you really don't want to risk stifling that agility. And this is why, you know, the traditional approaches that Central IT took, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I'm dating myself, but, you know, when we all tried this uh, in the mid 2000s with things like ESBs and SOAP and everything, uh, none of those approaches or very few of them were successful. And, and this comes down from an ivory tower approach for Central IT. This idea that, you know, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of architects who live in Central IT who may be disconnected from the realities of, of the different business units on the ground may try to dictate some you know, very heavy top-down approach. And then generally those things have, are so broad because an organization is so large, they don't fit the actual needs of the business and then the groups diverge anyway. So, so these approaches in particular aren't very effective for, uh, you know, for API and microservice strategies. Uh, very similarly, you know, uh, central IT groups are used to standing up heavy-handed heavy hand, handed centers of excellence. Uh, so essentially, you know, very kind of uh, prescriptive best practices that again can be stifling. So the idea is that you know you sort of want to meet meet the um, you know achieve your your goals for governance without tying the hands of the different different development groups that are building the software, 
And then finally, central IT groups are busy, right? So, you know, generally running an API practice is a lot of work. And I've seen like very large insurance companies do this successfully, but, you know, essentially they have dedicated teams that are, you know, pretty well staffed that, that are able to, uh, you know, to handle uh, running an API service or a, a, a service mesh as a platform. So unless central IT has that kind of, um, has that kind of, uh, uh, mandate from their leadership, it, you know, they have other dis other discussions and they really can't, uh, you know, essentially run like a globally federated API development practice uh, at scale successfully. But at the same time, Central IT has the same responsibilities, right? So regardless of, you know, whether or not you have a handle over how these APIs and microservices are being built, you're still responsible for governance, right? So yeah, ensuring that the code is, uh, that the APIs are implemented properly, that they follow best practices, that um, SLAs are enforced, right? So the second you have these APIs that are fronting systems of record, now you need to be careful about the implications of the backend systems um, and also be aware of the, the different SLAs that are, you know, that are being committed to the different lines of businesses to the clients. Uh, and then, you know, following that, there's, there's compliance, right? So you need to make sure that these APIs that are being exposed, they're not um, uh, incorrectly exposing data they shouldn't be. Uh, that, that certain things are tokenized, right? So if there's PII data that's going across the API payloads, uh, you need to make sure that they're not, you know, that they're not leaking those things in ways that they shouldn't be. Uh, from a similar standpoint, you know, this loops back to code quality, and I see this all the time. You know, if, if there's API implementations that are, are doing things that are incorrect from a logging standpoint. So maybe developers are leaving on debug statements that are logging full message payloads that contain social security numbers. Right, so all these things are, are, are stuff that, that central IT has to worry about. Uh, security is another obvious one. I, I talked about that you know, a couple of slides ago, but you also need to have a handle on making sure that there's a consistent security approach across the APIs. So for instance, if you are using SSL internally, you should make sure that you know, all the, uh, that the things like, like SSL certificate distribution are all coming from your CA versus snake oil certs. Um, if you're using, and you most likely are, if you're using a uh, enterprise-wide SSO solution, that the the APIs are integrated in with that for things like OAuth or SAP. And, and finally, IT is always worried about mitigating uh, shadow IT. So another big risk of these different pockets of lines of business trying to deploy these things quickly is that managers may swipe credit cards to, uh, you know, to deploy the APIs to AWS because central IT isn't fast enough to provide their own private cloud infrastructure. Right, so these are all things that you need to worry about. So what's the solution? So at Hypercurrent, we've developed a framework called Reference Architecture as a Service. Uh, so Reference Architecture as a Service is a framework to automate API governance. It allows central IT to simultaneously enforce multiple federation models while maintaining governance over their IT portfolios. Now to deliver this to our, our clients, we have a combination of professional services and then, um, and then technology that we leverage in order to, uh, you know, to achieve this goal. Uh, so essentially what Reference Architecture as a Service does is it allows uh, a central IT group to define a set of best practices and then enforce those best practices through modern DevOps techniques. So this is the idea that, that um, you know, maybe uh, if there is like, you know, successful pockets of API development to harvest that knowledge internally uh, codify it in a document where it could be distributed across the organization and then have the, um, you know, the, the programmatic and automatic things in place where this, this, these best practices are enforced from a, a DevOps perspective. Uh, and to accomplish this, we, we have an approach where we uh, do an initial enterprise maturity assessment. So the idea with the, the EM assessment is that uh, we use this to gauge the maturity of the enterprise in terms of their uh, in, in different uh, vectors in terms of their maturity, right? So uh, we look at, at things like operational maturity. So if there is, if they're maybe a fully on-premise organization, there's only some limited cloud adoption, or if they're, you know, fully hybrid cloud using, you know, a modern service mesh framework like Istio. And, and, and this lets us uh, sort of guide kind of how, how aggressive we are with the automation techniques. The second thing we do is deliver a four plus one architecture. So if one's not familiar, a four plus one architecture basically means you look at uh, look at the organization through through different uh, through different lenses of responsibility. So for instance, you, you look at the architecture from an operational perspective, then look at the architecture from the perspective of a developer who needs to develop code against it, 
then look at the architecture from the perspective of the business. And then this, this essentially provides a, a cohesive view of, uh, of, of how the, how the organization's operating architecturally from different angles. Uh, once we, we've done this initial, this initial planning and assessment, we look at introducing a catalog of site reliability, platform, and chaos engineering principles. Uh, so what this essentially lets us do is, <coughs> is leverage DevOps tooling. So, you know, things like, like Jenkins, Bamboo, uh, deployment automation via those, those frameworks, code quality inspection via Maven and Gradle, uh, te telemetry, and then um, uh, different load and performance testing frameworks to, to ensure that when APIs are actually built by different, by different groups, that they go through a rigorous set of tests automatically to ensure quality. And then if these, these tests fail, then the developers who are, are, um, who are deploying through this, they get an automated report of what's actually wrong. They can go and correct it. And if they need to, they can go and leverage, um, you know, leverage chat ops techniques or leverage Slack or, or something to that effect uh, to, to coordinate with someone within central IT to um, fix or improve or, or iterate through their, their API's implementation. Uh, another major piece we do once, a, once organizations have some maturity in this is we have an API metering and chargeback solution that layers into this where we can meter and monitor API utilization across an organization. And this lets us do things like determine how much um, usage a given line of business is leveraging certain APIs, determining the value of these, those APIs, uh, doing internal chargebacks across lines of business and central IT. And then once an organization has some muscle memory doing this, we can extend those techniques to external monetization approaches. And then finally, we have a set of automated API testing uh, uh, tooling that allows us, to, uh, allows us to validate the quality of APIs. Uh, so for instance, in, the, in one of the conversations we had in the speaker reception the other day for API days, we were talking about the open banking API specification. And one of the things we could potentially do with our API testing framework is actually validate that the APIs that um, conform to a specification actually implemented the way it should be. Right, so just because an API has a contract doesn't mean that it's actually conforming to that contract. So our API testing tooling allows us to automatically, um, automatically assess the, the quality of an API implementation. And then if it's, if it's not above a certain quality boundary, we can fail build and then do the same sort of process that I just talked about. So, so just to wrap up, so what are the, the outcomes of, as, of reference architecture as a service? Uh, so the first is that you get federated governance. So this means that you have the processes and teams to manage initiatives across all your ecosystem. Uh, so essentially, if you have a you know large geograph geographically distributed organization, this means that a group in one geography can actually federate that governance across essentially across time zones and, and different teams in a way that's scalable. Uh, the automation uh, tools facilitate CI/CD provisioning, monitoring, and DevOps velocity. Right. So this is sort of the holy grail of, of um, you know DevOps techniques in the sense that you can automatically deploy APIs to different platforms. Uh, the guardrails loop back to federated governance. So this means that you know if you're leveraging um, you know contractor teams or external teams you don't have a ton of control over these automated guardrails keep those teams in check. So particularly the API testing piece that I mentioned before, this means that you can potentially offload some API development say to third parties and you can let them um, or you can automatically assert the quality of what they're building versus going through manual um, QA and testing techniques. Uh, and then there's scalability through process and reusability. Uh, so, so this this approach means that you know you're essentially scaling the organization and scaling the limited resources of a central IT group across the whole organization. And then finally, it's speed of business, right? So reference architecture as service approach means we can provide the fifty percent reductions in onboarding development and defect resolution for APIs. So I think I'm close to time. Um, if you want to learn more about Hypercurrent or, or our approaches, you can go to hypercurrent.net. Uh, and you can follow me on LinkedIn uh, on the link you see there. So I'm happy to field any questions uh, or, or any other comments people might have. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, finished a bit earlier than I expected, so my apologies for that. Yeah.
sorry, Mark, I was talking a little bit quickly. I apologize. Too much coffee this morning. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I totally get it. I, I, it's never too much coffee. <laughs> and but, look at you, you're having more coffee. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. While saying I'm having too much coffee. No, that's fantastic. Um, thanks, and I'm glad you've got your LinkedIn um, information up here and uh, hypercurrents details there. But we'll just take that. If you mind, just stopping sharing the screen now oh, yeah. because it's yeah yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it was a whirlwind sort of tour, but it, which is fantastic. You know, it's really great for our audience to get in there and see what you're doing. Is there anything? What about with some of the work that you're currently doing with some of your um uh for some of your users? Is there is there an example from your current um? Uh, use uh, current uh, early adopters that you can talk about something that uh, unusual that they're doing or how it's helped them uh, improve their architecture. Uh, yeah, so one of the customers we were working with, they had a very competent central IT group based in um, based in North America. That was one of the innovation centers I mentioned. So they were very successful within their geography, and then because of that success, it almost bit them because now they were asked to go and essentially replicate that across different geographies in the organization. Um, and then obviously because of the, the constraints in this team and, and based on just frankly logistics around time zone and just spoken language, it wasn't something they could easily scale themselves. So they were able to leverage this framework to expand into uh, two additional geographies very quickly. Wow, fantastic. I mean, like the, I know people who have changed jobs rather than try to understand the architecture that they've then got to copy and deploy in a new a new area, you know, a new, uh, uh, you know, a new instance or a new um, uh, geography. You know, people prefer to leave and find a new job than do, the, yeah, yeah, do right. that because it's so poorly documented and all of that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, and, and that's a challenge too with younger developers, right? So a lot of you know kids coming out of college, they're used to working with modern, you know, modern frameworks like AWS and, and you know things like that. Right, if they come to a large organization that's very heavy-handed, that that's a totally different experience for them. That might, you know, force them to go jump to a smaller company. Frankly, so right. the the other idea with this is that it's a mentality shift for central IT to uh, to provide, you know, a, an experience that's that more similar to platforms that younger developers are used to working with versus heavy-handed approach approaches, while still maintaining governance and scalability and everything else that I talked about. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. How how comfortable are um, businesses in accepting the need for governance and, uh, you know, I mean, like, because a few years ago, governance wasn't something that anyone wanted to talk about. But now, I feel like now they now there is the recognition that it's a huge area as far as if you want to scale um, and if you, you've got a distributed system, then you need to have your governance in order. Is that well accepted at the moment, do you think? Or? I mean, yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I think if it's not, it becomes quickly accepted once there's a security breach, right? I mean, the right. second that's, you know, there's password leaks or something that, you know, that puts governance uh, front and center. Okay, sure. And so the, um, the uh, someone's put up in the chat, so it's hypercurrent.io for Hypercurrent. your site? That's right, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. Um, wonderful to have have you have your talk. Um, thank you um, for being with us, and thank you, audience. The we'll now be able to go to the Partners Village for um, our networking and expo break, and we'll be back here at three forty five GMT for GraphQL for fintech. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, thanks again, John. Cheers. Ciao. Bye.